Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you want to learn more about what UX design research is all about, then this is the episode for you because my next guest is a staff UX design researcher at LinkedIn with over 20 years of experience in a whole variety of related roles. But before I introduce you to Renee Reed, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out bright and early on Monday mornings, and it's got unique insights into dozens of different industries And of course, coronavirus relevant career advice, as well as a bunch of other hacks for young students and young professionals to help all of you turn your degrees into careers you'll love. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew. Because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Renee Reed, a staff UX design researcher at LinkedIn with over 20 years of professional experience in a variety of roles, including project management, customer experience, sales, and user experience. A sought after dynamic speaker and panelist, Renee's passions include inspiring the next generation of tech professionals, women of color, as well as introducing more underrepresented groups to tech, the UX industry, and LinkedIn. Prior to joining LinkedIn in April 2017, Renee spent six years at Career Builder, where she worked as a lead customer success manager and then as a user experience researcher. Renee began her post-college experience working at Honeywell in Georgia as a project coordinator. She was eventually promoted to senior project manager. And by the way, Honeywell is a Fortune 100 company. Renee, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Ready, and I'm probably going to be sipping some more as we're talking. (laughs) Excellent. What are you enjoying this morning? Every morning, it is just straight black coffee. No sugar, no cream. I am a purist at heart, just straight black. Okay. Do you have a particular brand of coffee that you like? Please don't tell me it's like Folgers. (laughs) <laughs> Folgers is on the backup just in case. I always keep one as a, an emergency, but yeah. there is Jamaican blue coffee that I really love. That's usually the go-to. Well, no surprise. Since I started Time for Coffee two and a half years ago, coffee has become even more important to me. And I've had the pleasure of interviewing people in the coffee industry. And I interviewed someone last week who started, he and his buddy started this coffee. And of course, as I'm saying this now, I'm blanking on the name of the coffee. I'll think in a second. But he got me, basically shamed me into buying a coffee bean grinder instead of using like my spice grinder. So now I'm doing it like where I weigh the beans. I'm weighing them on this little kitchen scale. I mean, it's super involved. I feel like I have a little... Like I'm a barista in my own home. So yes, yes. well, I'm excited to know that you've got your coffee, that you are a coffee lover. And I should also, for our listeners, Renee, who do not have the advantage of seeing you with your beautiful head wrap, they should know that Renee is also known as the queen of head wraps. It's gorgeous. And you also teach how to wrap hair. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. I've had so many inquiries of how can I do that? I want to wear that. And so it's been great. I've been doing some via virtual and when we used to do it in person. So it's been fantastic. And there's pictures floating around, I think, on my LinkedIn page around classes that I've done. So nice. definitely check that out. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll we'll include links in the bio in the show notes. So that'd be great. 
current title is Staff UX Design Researcher at LinkedIn. What does that mean? Could you break it down for us, Renee, for those who aren't familiar with UX and UI? And could you give us an example of something you've worked on? Yeah. So as a UX design researcher, I get to work with amazing people in creating the experiences on the platform and just throughout my career, just as a design researcher, really helping to create mobile and website or desktop, we call it desktop, experiences on software services that allow you to just be better in what you're doing in your day to day. And so the staff title, uh, I get a lot of questions about that. It's just in terms of seniority and, and your leveling, right? So some people start out as junior and then they may go to a senior researcher. And as a staff researcher, I'm what you call a individual contributor. So I'm not at a manager level. I don't manage people, but I'm at a senior, above senior level within the individual contributor route, the IC. And so one of the projects that I've always been so excited and proud about is on our mobile experience, we have a QR code that allows people to connect without having to type in their name or search for someone's name. So within the search bar, there's an icon that allows you to click on the QR code and it pops up and you have that code. And what's really cool about this feature is that you can download it. And so I put it in presentations when I'm speaking, even virtually. I actually download my QR code and put it in my presentation and just tell people, hey, put your camera up and it will take you to my profile. And so it's just been great. And this has been out for about two years now, but it's just the gift that keeps on giving as a feature that constantly keeps delighting people. Love it. What is a UX versus UI design researcher, and maybe there aren't even UI design researchers. So UX means user experience. What about the UI? And then what does it mean to be a UX design researcher? Yeah, so this is an age old conversation of people just like, what's the difference? So UI means user interface and UX, like you mentioned, is user experience. And so with the user experience design research, my role I'm working with, again, like I said, designers, engineers, product owners or product managers around understanding what is the right feature service experience that we're trying to bring to the user, in this case, the member. How do they use it? What makes sense? What are the pain points? What what are ways that we need to help them accomplish their goals? A UI, we hear like a UI designer or a UI engineer is really concentrated on creating those exact experiences. So taking the UX information that I'm providing and gathering, and then the UI person is actually building those components, those buttons, those colors that you see, and they're actually doing a lot, in some cases, a lot of coding to build the features that Myself as a design researcher, a UX designer is actually scoping, sketching, designing. The UI person is actually putting those into play on the user interface. Got it. So you actually do sketching in your role? So I know how to sketch. I know the design tools that our designers use. And that's just me personally. I just like to be, a, I'm curious and I'm a life learner. So I'm always looking to see what other people do in their roles and how can I help or understand them. So I've learned how to use certain tools that designers use and I've learned how to sketch. Now I'm not doing like full workflows, but I'm able to do really scrappy mocks and concepts, whether that's a hand sketch where I'm just creating boxes and placeholders for things, or I'm doing it digitally. So it is a skill set that some researchers have. It's not a must. I wouldn't say that a lot of people necessarily do it, but I think it is good for researchers to be able to acquire at least an understanding so that when they're working with their partners, they can say, hey, this is what I was thinking. This is what And then at least provide a visual for that. So yeah, I I can sketch. And like like I said, I work with some talented designers who have helped me to get better in sketching. And so that helps me in terms of leveling up who I am as a researcher. Got it. So what Mm -hmm. do you do 
as a researcher, could you break it down for us in terms of what all your responsibilities are, Renee? Yeah. So a day in a life of a researcher uh, for me looks like talking with product owners, business analysts, understanding kind of what do we need to do? What is what is happening in our systems? How can we make it better? And really digging into finding out the why, what's the problem, creating these user stories so that I can let the product people know or designers know exactly what users need. So in my career, it's always been about needle finding and understanding. I also do a lot of secondary research. And what that means is I have to go and look at any other research or experiments that have already been done. You know, a lot of times research isn't about starting a new study, but really investigating what is already out there and understanding and then bringing that in, bringing that data in and then seeing where the gaps are. Where are the holes and the opportunities that we want to investigate more? So you really help bring the story to life and translate what needs to happen. And then it's about interviewing participants taking that information and then defining what exactly the problem is, working with designers to help sketch out how do we solve that problem, testing out those designs with users, and then taking that and saying, hey, this is where we should go, really providing that direction before engineers product build it and then ship it and then it gets into the user's hands officially. You mentioned the QR code that you were involved in developing and in researching. Could you take us into the process that you as a UX design researcher were involved in as you were getting the information that you needed, those user stories that you needed in order to inform the design and the product development? Yeah, this is such a great process. And I love telling this story because this is something that is really relatable. And so what was happening was while I was attending conferences and speaking at conferences, and as a researcher, what will happen is, you know, you're always kind of alert and watching and just being mindful of things all around you, how people are interacting with things. And what I started to discover is that people were connecting with one another in these ways where they would say, hey, you know, what's your name? I want to connect with you on LinkedIn. And it was just this weird interaction sometimes where people were just kind of looking down at their phones, trying to type, retype a name. They didn't understand the spelling. And then at sometimes I saw where people were actually handing their phones off to a complete stranger and saying, hey, type your name in so that I can find you because I'm not being a finder. And it was just a really interesting interaction. And so that was kind of a use case of there's something here. Like, how can we make this experience better so it doesn't seem so awkward? And so working with a great and amazing product owner that was working on something similar, I was able to take this real life experience to say, hey, we have a use case here and really translating that. And then again, interviewing people and understanding. And we just said, what would be a better way, almost seamless way for people to connect that could bring them as element of surprise and seamless interaction that doesn't have to be this awkward, hey, you take my phone. (laughs) I mean, I'll take your phone, I'll type my name in. How can we make this better? And so working with the designers and going through various solutions, and we distilled it down to you, hey, could a QR code work here? Now, QR codes have been around for decades. This is not a new technology. We just leverage something that we saw worked in other spaces. If you think about when you go to take a flight somewhere and you don't necessarily have to have a paper ticket, you have a barcode or a code to scan. There's something seamless about being able to take out your phone and just scan it. And so looking at those type of experiences and how we could translate that is how we got to the idea of the QR code. And so we did a lot of testing to figure out what was the right way to do it. And then we heard feedback of, hey, what if I wanted to have my QR code on a business card or something like that? And we were able to create that experience where you're able to download it now. Like I said, and put it in presentations even. Yeah. So how many interviews did you end up doing? I know you've said you don't always like reinvent the wheel with research. Mm -hmm. You're going out there and you're probably researching to see what other research has been done. 
How long, how many interviews did you do and how long was the process of research before the product was then incorporated into the platform? I'll respond to that in terms of more of a general. So it takes anywhere from a couple of weeks to months, even years of research. So it really depends on the project, how much research you need, the timeline that's involved. And I like to say that research is never done. So part of being a researcher in design is this iterations to constantly make it better. So research is still taking place on how are people utilizing it now that it's out? Is it working still? Is it beneficial now that people aren't necessarily in person a lot? How can this experience be better in this virtual space? So research is always happening. It's not a linear type experience. It's more of the circular of evaluation evaluating, shipping, developing, shipping, coming back around, evaluating, shipping again. So yeah, it's it's a continuous process. So projects can take anywhere from a couple of weeks, months, and like I said, even years. And how many different research projects do you have ongoing at any given time? Yeah, it depends. You can work on one long, what we call longitudinal study, where it's going over a long period of time. You have different people you're working with or more short usability studies. You will hear a lot of that in industry and you'll see what we call usability studies where researchers are testing concepts and designs. Is it for lack of the better term or word, is it usable? Can people use this thing? And so as researchers, you just have these different types of skill sets where you're doing either, you know, quick usability studies to test, you're doing more longer qualitative studies where you're just doing interviews, you're not necessarily showing any designs, doing what we call discovery or foundational type things. So you're just kind of really understanding the problem space. And then you're doing even quantitative where you may do surveys. And then depending on the scale, you know, you could be doing surveys up to the thousands and you're having to distill all these data points of thousands of responses and surveys and then plus the qualitative style. So you can have smaller studies, you can have larger studies. You just, as a researcher, you have to have that flexibility to know what is the appropriate type of methodology to use at the appropriate time and then apply that with your team. It's so interesting listening to you describe the functions of your job because you are clearly somebody who loves people, You're an extrovert, you're a great communicator, but you're also describing the functions of a job that would be really good for somebody maybe who is an introvert, who really likes to kind of crunch data, look at spreadsheets, work on pivot tables. Do you think that the best researchers, design researchers, are sort of a mix of the two personalities? Absolutely. I think, and I don't want to say the best, I think this this space is open for all types. I think you hit the nail on the head in the sense of, yes, I exude this very extrovert, outgoing personality, but I definitely have these times where I need to be quiet by myself thinking and really distilling down information that I have to shut down the world and really get into a super hyper-focused way. And so, yeah, I have this capability of having both this, they call it ambivert, correct me if I'm wrong or someone correct me, but yeah, it's it, there's this middle lane of being a extrovert and an introvert that has been talked about. And yeah, I think it's important to be able to do and and have the capabilities of both. So I just looked it up and you're 100% right, Renee. An ambivert is a person whose personality has a balance of extrovert and introvert features. There you go. Ta-da. There you Gold go. Star for me. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> so Renee, as you know, I ask my guests when we're picking the time for them to do the interview, if there are any topics that they would like to discuss during our interview. And you suggested creating space as a black woman or as black women in tech. Could you elaborate on that topic and why it's so important for you at this time? Yeah, during my pivot 
into this space, I attempted to really find people who looked like me that I could get some insights in terms of their experience, right? As a Black woman, as a researcher in the tech space. And I just could not find enough or any at the time. And so, you know, that could have really derailed me in the sense of, well, no one's there and is this the right thing? But it actually pushed me. It actually pushed me in a way that I wanted to make sure that if someone else who came behind me wanted to be able to see someone in this space, that they could find someone. And so I really hone in and lean in on the importance of why amplifying my voice is really important. It's because I can be found that other Black women who are seeking to get into this field are able to say, oh, I I know someone or I see someone. And I'm not saying that I want to be the only voice, not at all. I want to be able to direct them to the other women, the other spaces that these Black women are in and just kind of open up people's eyes that we are here and you, you can be in this space and there is room for you. And so really making sure that creating the space where Black women are seen and heard, appreciated, and and elevated is really important to me. And that we can be our authentic selves, that we can come representing who we are and know that it's appreciated and important. So as you mentioned, me and my head wraps and being able to just be in this space and be authentically me, I am able to thrive because I am able to be me and be this professional researcher and design researcher and queen of head wraps. And this is all of me that I get to bring to this field that I'm doing. And so women need to see that, and especially Black women, that they can wear their natural hair, they can wear braids, they can wear head wraps, things like that. And they don't have to strip away anything about themselves that they don't think is not going to represent or show up. And so that's something that I've battled with in my own career. But when I finally realized that I'm actually better at doing what I need to do as a professional when I am myself, it just opened up a whole new world. And I want other women to be able to thrive just like me. That is beautiful. What advice, Renee, do you have for our, especially for our young Black women viewers and listeners who may still be in college right now, they may even be in high school at this point, and they're listening to you, they're watching you, and they're maybe encouraged to dip their toe in the water. What do you wish you had known when you were at the beginning of this journey? The importance of just going for it and, and and trusting your gut. I was a first generation college student and I had to navigate a lot of this space on my own. It's a different time, didn't have necessarily a lot of access to all the things that we have now. So I had to really navigate and figure things out on my own. And I honestly was was scared because I didn't know. And I wasn't sure. And so I really held myself back in a lot of areas because of that uncertainty. I figured it out eventually, you know, and I was able to navigate the space. But I wish I had known that just trusting my gut and just going for and not allowing the fear to get in the way, I could have just been thriving at a different level probably earlier on that could have just helped me progress in a different way because now I see the benefit of it and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I could have been doing this a long time ago because it was already in me. It was already who I was, but I was suppressing a lot of that because of the uncertainty. And so I just, you know, I encourage my younger self, the younger people, like you said, high school, college, black women, just trust your gut, go for it and just be your whole self. And this time you're going to grow. I had to grow. We all grow. But the journey is worth it once you, again, just allow yourself, Mm -hmm. give yourself permission, give yourself permission to thrive and to go for it. Yeah. It was just, it's just, it was just an eye opening moment in my life and my career when I finally realized like, what was I doing? Like, I just needed to just be me and own it. So, well, I, I want to say a couple of things because I think it is common, especially for women of all ages, to experience what's known as the imposter syndrome. And in fact, that 
term or descriptor was coined back in the mid 70s, 70s, Mm -hmm. right, by two women psychologists who were researching the new women in the workforce, because before then, there weren't very many women in the workforce, just writ large. And women tend to feel more like gosh, what am I doing here? Everybody else knows so much more than I do. I have experienced the imposter syndrome in every single industry I went into. And I share that because it's normal. And I've met many men who experience the imposter syndrome. So I just think that's if you're somebody who is a high achiever, who just has drive in you, you are going to feel like, what am I doing here? And I'm guessing that is amplified when you are someone who has, especially as you just alluded to, Renee, a woman, a woman of color who is entering an industry in which there aren't many people who look like you. Yeah, hundred percent. And I do want to just really briefly touched on the imposter syndrome. So I'm so glad you brought that up. And I, in no way or shape or form, I think it's amazing that people are understanding and and kind of naming that feeling. But I do feel like sometimes, and I'm not discounting anyone who's named it for themselves. I think in the last couple of years, that term has actually been almost projected on people. and, And I'll just speak for like women, projected in a way that now they they carry it and they're just like, I have it. And I caution people and just like, don't put on something that you didn't necessarily have. It could have just been fear. It could have just been, like I said, uncertainty, but not necessarily the imposter syndrome itself. And like I said, I'm not going to discount anyone who like you felt it through your career and if that's what you identified. But I've seen too many times, especially young people who put on the term and it's a big term because everyone's saying it, you hear it a lot. And they've kind of like put themselves in that position. And they're just like, this is what I have. I I have the imposter syndrome. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, don't do that to yourself so quickly because you've just put yourself in a box and now you've named this thing and you've put this thing on and you didn't really need to. And that's just kind of what we do. Like we hear something like, oh, that's it. And that's me. And I'm just like, but is it? So, and that's really important, especially for black women in that we don't project and carry extra weight that we don't need. I hear you. (laughs) I hear you. And actually, so tell me if, if this resonates with you, Renee, there's a difference between feeling fear, like, Ooh, I've never tried this before. This is a new experience and the imposter syndrome. So everyone feels anxiety, starting a new job, starting in a new industry. That doesn't mean you have the imposter syndrome. Exactly. That's exactly it. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I just cool. want to make sure that people yeah, distinguish don't blow that. it and, up uh, into something that yes. it is. Okay. I hear you. Exactly. I hear you. Excellent. <laughs> exactly. So I want to ask you, Renee, about your experience working at another big company called Career Builder, where you work for just over six years. But first, would you mind sharing with our young listeners and viewers why you have chosen to work at big tech companies versus smaller startups or even smaller, more established tech companies? A large part of this is because of just where I was in my life. I was a mother. I had two children. I was at the time divorced at the time. So I could not take necessarily the risks at the time that I felt that would have left me without insurance or a certain type of steady paycheck. And so I just made the conscious decision that I needed that security, not necessarily for myself, but for my children. And so, again, I always encourage people, if you are able to take what we call intelligent risks and make sure you are mitigating any of those risks. But the companies that I chose to work for, I just 
really have been really, really fortunate as well to be in a space where I was encouraged and, and, and motivated more to go after kind of these bigger companies and actually apply myself to the bigger company. So back in Atlanta at Career Builder, I had gotten laid off. I was wow, I just realized so I had gotten laid off. I had I was in the middle of the recession back in 2000. I like you said, I was a waitress in between that. So at that time, I was desperately searching for something really secure. And I really wanted to just to get out of this hole I was in financially and career wise and things like that. So I was determined to get into a space where I felt like I could grow. So that's where a career builder came in and so thankful for my years there, amazing people. And that's where I made the pivot into UX research after being in, at the time it was called client support. Now industry calls it customer success or customer experience. But at the time it was called something else. But that helped me understand, again, customers, users, what their business needs and goals were. That helped my skills as a researcher within that same company because I was able to come with a lot of domain knowledge of who our customers were and translate that. And so I was able to leverage these type of experience in these big companies to then make the transition to here in Silicon Valley. And what I loved about my road here was that at the time, I was actually getting pursued or getting reached out to you by recruiters to interview. And this was something that never happened before. I was always the job seeker who was pursuing and applying and applying. And the first time in career, Recruiters were calling me or reaching out to me to say, hey, we're interested in talking to you. And it blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute, I don't have to look. Someone's actually looking for me right now. And that was just, it was weird. It was something new that I had never thought about, right? Where I was actually the one being pursued. And it just made me realize like, oh, I'm doing something right. I'm in an industry, in a, in a profession that is in high demand. People want skill sets to make their companies better. So I realized that I was a huge asset. And so, yeah, it was just so encouraged to go for the big companies. Nice, nice. And as we discussed in our Espresso Shots interview and check out the bio and show notes to see if Renee's Espresso Shots interview has already dropped, that's where we get into how to break into the field of UX design research. Renee explained that she also got UX certified while she was at Career Builder, which is amazing. Renee, I'd like to flash back very quickly to when you were in college at Savannah State University in Georgia. It's a historically black university. You majored in marketing and communications. Did you know what you were going to do with that degree when you graduated, Renee? Absolutely not. I actually started out as a radio and television major and I just knew I was going to be the next Oprah and I was going to have my own radio and television show. And then I made a pivot, I think my junior year to marketing and said, okay, I'm going to do something in marketing. I don't know what it is. And it was actually PR marketing at the time. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do PR. And just started to look at positions and started to apply and could not get into PR at all. And at the time, I had no idea the importance of networking and understanding, you know, certain industries are very heavy on referrals and people who are already in the industry and it's almost clicky sometimes. And so you have to make sure that you know people who are already there. I had no idea about that. I was like, I'm just going to apply to these positions. And so I definitely did not know what direction I was going to go to. I just knew that I had to get a job. I had student loans and they were going to be due soon and I need to pay the bills. And so, yeah, I just applied to different positions and got a position as a project manager because as marketing... So I was just going to ask you, what was your first job when you graduated and how did you get it? Yeah. So I was in Savannah at the time and this job was actually in Atlanta. So I wanted to stay in Savannah. I love the city, love just the people, love the food. Oh my gosh, Savannah food. Yes. And so I wanted to stay, (laughs) but I could not find any job. So then I got out of my own head and said, okay, maybe I need to look broader. 
maybe I need to think about, you know, moving to a different city. So not being afraid, not being scared and just saying, hey, let's just, and I wanted to stay in Georgia, stay in the South. So I decided to apply myself in Atlanta. And then that's where the opportunities really started to come out and just thinking about a different city to move to, to at least get my career started. And so I was able to apply. I actually got this position through an agency. And so this agency, it wasn't a direct hire. I went through an agency they hired me. And then after six months, I was able to come on full time with full benefits to the company. So that was great. And my first experience, again, going through an agency and then going to full time. And even in that experience, it was kind of weird because someone had to campaign for me, not myself. Like I went for the interview But in the agency, the recruiter, of course, is the one really making sure that they're negotiating your salary and things like that. So that was my first experience with that. Do you remember where that first job was, Renee, and what the title was? Yeah. So the company was called, at the time it was called EMS Technologies, but they were bought by Honeywell. So it was EMS Technologies and they dealt with what we call access points and in, in warehouse management systems. It was really cool, really fascinating. So access points and uh, and data warehouse systems. So really quick, it's when tractor trailers or trucks are driving in and out of warehouse systems and they're connecting to things. Or if you are at the store and you go to cash out and you use a scanner to scan the price of things, that scanner is actually talking to an access point up in the ceiling and transmitting all that information out. And so I got to work with some really big distributors and companies. So I had a little bit of taste of technology uh, there. And so that kind of started the road to technology. Thank you. Because I know from looking at your LinkedIn profile, you took a job in 2000 as a project coordinator at Mm -hmm. Honeywell, which is a Fortune 100 tech company. And you worked there for six years. You were promoted to become a senior project manager. And then you left in November 2006. Why? So this was the first time in my career that I got laid off. So I was laid off in 2006 and been with the company six years. Thought I was going to be with the company for a lot longer. So that was a huge blow for me. And I was, I just remember being so sad and so upset and just not certain what I wanted to do. Because again, this was, I was ready to grow with the company. And I had always been taught that once you get a job, you stay there for years, you don't leave, you retire after 20 years. So I had never thought I was going to leave that job, work with great people. And so this was this force function of Mm, this is not forever. What are you going to do now? And then went into sales. Yeah, I tried something new. I was just like, okay, well, let's let's see what's out there. And I actually <laughs> did sales and was a department head for a really big gym or fitness club. It was a 24-hour Lifetime fitness, fitness club. Fitness. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was gorgeous. I mean, if you've ever been in a Lifetime Fitness Club, it is like its own city. There's like a water park or water slide indoors. There's a spa, basketball courts, upstairs, just gorgeous. And so I did sales there. And that was amazing until the recession hit. And then you realize when there was at that time when the recession hit, the gym was a luxury for a lot of people. And they stopped coming to the gym and stopped buying memberships. And I had to leave there because I just wasn't making any money whatsoever, and then had the biggest shift of my career and took my degree, my years of experience, all of my skills, and walked into a restaurant and applied to be a hostess and a waitress. On your LinkedIn profile, you write, I'm listing this experience at Waka de Pepo, to show others the path to UX wasn't a straight line. And I even leveraged skills I obtained as a hostess and waitress today as a UX researcher. The effects of the 2008 recession caused me to take my four-year college degree and years of professional experience and humbly walk into a local restaurant 
where I was hired as both a hostess and a waitress. And as I shared with you, Renee, before we started this interview, I was fired twice in my 40, and I was forced to reinvent myself, and the experiences were not related to the recession. But I can tell you, it hurt just as much as if I was laid off due to the recession, and I had to swallow yes. my pride, and I had to take a job that I wouldn't have otherwise taken, and hold my head up high. And I say that because one of the questions I try to ask all of my guests is if they would share an experience in their lives when they stumbled, when they maybe fell flat on their face, and most important, how they persevered, and if there was a lesson that they learned in the process. So Renee, over to you. What would you say was it this experience? Was it something else? And what was the lesson that you learned? That would definitely be the standout experience is becoming a hostess and the waitress. I, like you mentioned, I had so much pride because again, here I was with my four year degree and had worked for this big, these big companies, had all these great experiences. And I was going to be a hostess and a waitress. I had never done it in high school. I didn't do it in college. And here I was this professional and I was just going back and I just, I was so prideful, but I had to put pride aside. And like I said, humble myself and walk in there. And I remember the manager, I will never forget. And I still talk to him to this day. He's just fantastic. He looked at my resume and he was like, what are you doing here? What, what are you doing here? And I just remember sitting back in the booth because we interviewed in the restaurant. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm, what am I doing here? And he was like, you're overqualified. And it just hit me. And I was like, well, thanks for reminding me. But I was like, I need a job. I have a mortgage. I, like, I don't know what else to do. I have children I need to take care of. And I need a job. And he just saw the probably the desperation in my eyes. But he also saw something where he was just like, listen, you clearly are dedicated. And you clearly and I had had energy up to that point. And he's like, and I have no doubt you're going to be able to do this job well, but are you going to do it for a long time? And I was said, I, I'll do it as long as I need to in order to take care of my family and, and take care of what I need to. But it just turned out to be such an amazing an experience. I And for those who know who Buga de Beppo, the restaurant is, it is just an eclectic place. And it's, it's an experience when you go to Buga de Beppo. There is a hostess stand that kind of looks like a pulpit that you stand up on. So you're actually a little bit higher than everyone. And so I would literally make that into an experience when people would walk in, I would be in this grand stand. And so I just knew to take a situation and still have hope. And I always say this, like I might've felt helpless, but I wasn't hopeless. And that was the driving factor. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this with excellence. I'm going to do this with the same excitement and discipline as if I was making, you know, a large salary at this other company. I am still going to take that same type of principles and apply it as a waitress, and as a hostess. And it was such a great experience. One of the humbling moments during my, my first shift as a waitress was scraping food off of a plate. And it was a lot of food. So the portions at Buca de Beppo were really large, like family style. And I remember scraping off so much food off of the plate. And it just crushed me because it made me realize, one, just how wasteful people can be with food, how much food people who, are, who need food could have access to. And it did something in me where I said, I need to make sure that I'm changing the way that I think about food and, and people who need food. And it just did something with me. And then there was a level of empathy that kicked in at that moment that I use today. Like empathy is so important into understanding people. I wasn't necessarily hearing someone's story verbatim. They weren't telling me. But as I was experiencing this moment, I could feel someone's story. I can imagine someone's story. And that made a difference in how I carried my experience as a waitress, and even now today, fast forward, 
as a user experience researcher in feeling people's stories without necessarily hearing them, but understanding people's struggles, what they need, pain points, things like that. I can I can see and hear the empathy mm. that you exude. Thank you so much for sharing that, Renee. Oh, thank you. That's such an important question. So the last question is, if you could go back to college, go back to Savannah State University, where you were, by the way, the senior class president, and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? Take those chances and take them early and often. There was a time when I was doing my pivot in my degree where I actually was thinking about minoring in computer science. And I remember people, my advisor, like, that's too much. You're doing marketing and you're trying to do computer science. Like, what are you doing? And I allowed people to talk me out of it. And at the time, the school was actually offering a kind of dual curriculum with Georgia Tech. And gosh, Georgia Tech, like, come on, like one of the premier schools in Georgia in the country. And I was just so curious about it. And I was just like, I know nothing about computer science stuff, but there's something that I'm just I'm curious about. And I allowed people to talk me out of it. And fast forward now, being in the tech space where, you know, I have acquired a technology information where I can do HTML and CSS and know how to do a little bit of coding because I stuck with it and wanted to learn. But had I just listened for it or stayed with it early, it would have made a difference. Oh my goodness. We know why you are not just the queen of raps, but the queen (laughs) in tech. You are such an incredible woman. You've had such an incredible journey. And who is to say you will not still become the next Oprah Winfrey? Remember, life is a journey and you are still early in your journey, Renee. I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. If you want to learn more about how to break into this fascinating industry, check out the bio, check out the show notes to see if Renee's Espresso Shot episode has dropped. Renee, thank you so, so much. I learned an incredible amount. No, thank you for creating this space for this conversation. I really do appreciate it. Coffee cheers to you. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.